Hello and welcome to module 24. We're getting near the end of the semester, um, but we still have a few very important topics to discuss and one of them is fair lending. Um, another big area of compliance concern and something the regulators take very seriously and examine for. So the big kind of fair lending statute is the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. And as we've discussed, this was enacted in the 1970s when we saw a lot of consumer protection statutes. Um, it was originally enacted to protect credit discrimination, basically um, against women. What was happening at this time was that divorce was becoming more common and more acceptable. And women who divorced were unable to get credit because at this point, all credit was in the name of the man if a person was married. It was um, in fact, not possible for a married woman to get credit in her own name, typically. It wasn't like a law, it was just a practice. And so women, who may have taken care of the finances of their families for many years, once they got divorced, had no credit history whatsoever. So the Equal Credit Opportunity Act was enacted to prohibit discrimination on the basis of sex or marital status. Over time, um, it has been amended. And so now it prohibits credit discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, national origin, sex still, marital status still, or age provided you can contract. And there are certain exceptions actually for giving older individuals some benefit um, or the fact that you receive income from public assistance or the fact that you have exercised any of your rights under any of these consumer protection statutes that we have discussed. Now, you might notice that this list does not seem all inclusive of bases that we can find discrimination on. And there are state anti-discrimination laws or state anti-credit discrimination laws that add additional categories such as handicap or sexual orientation. And it's worth noting that in the area of um, discrimination, there is no preemption. So a bank must comply with the Federal Equal Credit Opportunity Act and any state counterparts that may add additional bases. Um, they also, often the state laws will add um, military status as well. Something interesting about the Equal Credit Opportunity Act is it the, is the one consumer protection statute that provides for punitive damages um, because discrimination is thought of as more, more evil, more corrosive to society, say, than a uh, disclosure violation, there are punitive damages along with the statutory damages, the actual damages, the attorney's fees, the private right of action, the class action authority, all the things that we've seen in the other consumer protection statutes um, enacted at the same time period. So we did read a case and you might notice that it was one of the authors of your book um, who brought a case in the 70s when he he and his fiance tried to apply for a mortgage. And what we see, which would have been common at this time actually, is the lender refused to combine their incomes because they were not married. And the district court seemed to think that was fine um, because being married gives you certain legal rights. And so despite the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, uh, the lower court said it makes sense to treat unmarried people differently. It would be, let me tell you, very unusual for unmarried people to buy a home together in the 1970s. But fortunately, there was an appeal and the higher court said, this is exactly what you're not permitted to do. Although it says the marital status, um, we were thinking of divorced women, it actually applies to this case too. You just can't treat people differently because they're married or unmarried. Um, and so, you know, maybe that seems common sense um, in today's world, but in the 1970s, it was, as you can see, something that didn't seem like common sense, not only to a lender, but even to a lower court. So that is kind of an overt type of discrimination, but the next case, is probably a more typical kind of situation where we see a minority 
borrower, a black woman turned down for a loan. Um, and the bank feels completely justified because they say your home did not appraise enough. And typically your home has to appraise to a certain percentage of what you're seeking. Um, but the woman says, I'm credit worthy. So you're discriminated against me. Um, and the bank says, well, you're not credit worthy because you don't have the right collateral. So just to kind of go through the facts, because they do seem a bit concerning to me, um, this woman applies for a mortgage. The bank says she's credit worthy. Everyone agrees with that. But they have this loan to value rule and their her home comes in at only $45,000, which really surprises her because it had a praise for 82 the year before. Um, she submits this information. It's rejected by the bank. She's denied. But she is able to get a loan at a higher interest rate. And this other lender appraises her home at $79,000. So, you know, even though 79 and 82, that, you know, you see they're not exactly the same, they're in the same ballpark. So she sues. And part of the question is, what is the test here? You know, is this sort of a prima facie of a case of discrimination, which she believes it is? Or has she just not qualified because of the lack of collateral? And so, it's kind of interesting because we see them both agreeing to much of the facts. It's only what the burden is. And this court, which is not necessarily the common position, basically rejects sort of both of their positions and just says, you need to show us more evidence. We don't think the fact that the appraisal was wildly different shows discrimination. And we don't think the fact that all the notes were lost should imply anything. Um, I don't know if we would have the same outcome today. There has been a lot more focus on appraisals, um, a lot more standards. But in general, if you're in compliance, the thing you have to really worry about is anything that is subjective. Anytime you have anything that is subjective in the process, there is room for discrimination. And so as a compliance professional, who doesn't want to cross the line or even have an allegation of discrimination, typically we're looking for more black letter rules. And in fact, there's been a lot of changes in appraisals. So I don't know that, although appraisals still see, you know, seem to be a bit, you know, I don't know, squishy. Um, I, I, I think something like this would probably get more attention. And in part, because there's a lot more awareness of something that we'll talk about um, potentially called redlining or reverse redlining. And that has to do with undervaluing homes in certain neighborhoods. Um, and that is something that is that always a concern, but it's a particular concern in mortgage lending. And that is why um, fair lending and anti-discrimination are most um, most serious and taken really um, take a lot of extra effort when we're talking about mortgages because it is typically people's largest transaction. It's where they live. It really impacts um, the life of the individual as really as well as sort of the success of cities. Um, if, if people can't get mortgages to buy homes and remodel homes, it can really lead to all kinds of negative consequences for the neighbors, for the cities, um, and really for everyone. So one of the things you, that we see from these two cases, we sort of have the first case where it's um, you know very clear, there's admission of the facts, they treated them differently because they were married. We see this second situation where the bank you know, says there's absolutely no discrimination and the court finds there isn't evidence of that. And it starts to make you wonder how, how do you prove discrimination? It's, it's very difficult. And so one of the theories that has developed under ECOA is the effects test or disparate impact. And that is that you can establish discrimination under ECOA if you have a facially neutral policy that negatively impacts a protected group. And so this, again, is a big focus of compliance professionals in that if a practice has come up and it seems reasonable, it's really 
required to have evidence to back it up so that if you find that it has a disparate impact, you can basically counteract that claim. Because how this is tested for is you sort of look at who a bank or another lender is lending to and you know, is the distribution inappropriately? And then you kind of look to see, you know, what is it that this individual um, is doing? This bank, you know, what policies do they have that seems to be leading to, you know, no minority borrowers getting getting loans? And so the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has put out this fair lending bulletin to explain that ECOA prohibits a credit practice that is discriminatory in effect because it has a disproportionately negative impact on a prohibited basis, even though the creditor has no intent to discriminate and the practice appears neutral on its face, unless the practice can meet a legitimate business need that cannot reasonably be achieved as well by means that are less disparate in their impact. And so to give you maybe a concrete example of that, um, creditors are permitted to look at income. When you look at income, white men have the highest incomes. So requiring income has a negative impact on protected individuals, but there's really no better way to figure out ability to repay than looking at income. So you're allowed to look at income. But let's say, um, I actually had a client once say, well, we want to ask people whether or not they have kind of a month to month cell plan or a real contract. And we're going to give them more points in the process for having an established cell phone. And I said, do you have evidence that shows that there is a correlation? And they're like, well, no, we don't have evidence, but it just seems like it would. Well, that's a red flag. It just seems like it would. That's not a good reason. Um, and that can get you into trouble. And the other thing that gets lenders into trouble is, as I said, discretionary um, parts of the approval process. And an example of that is in a fifth third consent order um, where fifth third, they actually did their own self audits and found that this was happening. They did their own self audit and they found that African-American and Hispanic borrowers were paying more and they brought it to the attention of the regulators. Um, but what this practice was, was that they were buying motor vehicle loans and they gave the motor vehicle dealers um, two and a half percentage points that they could sort of play with in negotiating these deals. And so this is a discretionary system. And if the motor vehicles dealers were able to get the borrowers to agree to the highest interest rate, the dealers got to keep that markup. Um, and what Fifth Third found when they were auditing these loans that they were buying from these dealers was that systematically, people with the same credit scores were paying more when they were members of a protected class. So they realized they had a problem. Interestingly, when they agreed to pay this penalty and they brought it to the regulator's um, attention, they agreed to decrease the discretionary markup, but they did not eliminate it. So I guess they felt that this was an important part of their process, um, but they realized that two and a half was just too much discretion. They also, I'm sure, engaged in training um, and other types of proactive activities to minimize the risk of this discrimination. But this was a really good example of one, how the bank is held responsible. In this case, the bank was not discriminating. No one said the bank was discriminating. Any discrimination was occurring at the dealership level but the bank had set up a process that encouraged discrimination. And so the bank was the one held responsible. Um, getting back to mortgages, which I said is really a key concern uh, because of the importance of mortgages in both the economy and individuals' lives. Um, also in the 1970, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act was enacted and has a reg regulation C, and it is merely a reporting statute. Um, all mortgage lenders have to report various statistics to the federal government, and it's designed to deal with what I referred to previously as redlining, which is a refusal at the time 
to lend in certain neighborhoods. And now they've expanded the scope of the reporting um, to also require reporting um, as to pricing. It used to be just applications, acceptance, rejection. Now there's a lot more information that's required. And it un un unearths, I would say, patterns or potential patterns of discrimination. And so um, it, it is typically only required of financial institutions in metropolitan areas. Those are population areas. And it's required any time a mortgage application is made, a mortgage loan is made, or a mortgage loan is purchased. And it applies not only to home purchase loans, but improvement loans and refinancing. And it has been expanded to open-end lines of credit, which be, would be a home equity line of credit secured by a mortgage, um, as well as to business purpose. And so the real goal, as I said, is to alert the government to whether more investigation is needed. It is purely a reporting statute. Another 1970s statute enacted to deal with potential discrimination um, is the Community Reinvestment Act. It was enacted in 1977. And the thing to remember about that, unlike ECOA and HUMDA, it applies only to banks. And so what the Community Reinvestment Act does is it says depository institutions are required to serve the con convenience and need of the communities in which they are chartered to do business. And so, as we've talked about, that is kind of part of the chartering process, um, this requirement that you know banks serve the community. Um, and so it sets out that that's an obligation. And then it says that the federal regulators will examine the institutions to assess their record of meeting the needs um, and that they will take this record into account when they're evaluating any type of financial institution. And specifically, it goes on to say that any time a financial institution, a bank, is seeking some kind of an approval, such as to acquire, a, uh, let's say, a branch, to acquire another bank, to merge with another holding company, any type of approval will include a CRIA review. Um, and so what they do is they look at whether they're serving the community in which the bank has branches. At least that's traditionally how it's worked because that's traditionally how banking worked. They look at banks, they see where they have offices and they see, you know, one, one do you have, do you have branches in all kinds of communities? Then are you making loans in these communities? Do you have an ATM in these communities? Um, but what we've just recently seen is that they realize so much banking is done online that the CRA ratings will now also focus on communities in which the banks are making mortgage and small business loans online. Um, there's a few years to implement this because it will really open up the field of what is what is looked at. Um, but I think it's it's been a struggle to figure out how to kind of apply some of these location-based legal requirements to banks in the internet environment that we live. Um, there are four ratings, although one sort of has two. So it's outstanding, satisfactory high, satisfactory low, needs to improve or substantial non-compliance. These are public um, and obviously outstanding is good or satisfactory high or low is okay, but really outstanding is required to get any of the sort of the best treatments such as becoming a financial holding company and really if you have a satis even a satisfactory low, you're probably not going to get anything approved. Now, taking into account the different size of institutions, there are actually four different ways the test is applied. Um, there is a small bank test, which is based on assets, where they really are just going to look at whether they are lending to low and moderate individuals. There's an intermediate, um, small bank test where they're gonna look at the lending, but they're also gonna look at the community development test. And what that is, is basically a combination of two and three for the large banks. So two and three below is the lending test. Also the investment test is 
the bank, you know, are they making loans to those investing in these communities? And do they have physical branches or ATMs or other types of services in a variety of communities? And so the intermediate small bank can either choose to um, be evaluated on the investment test or the service test or a combination. Um, and the large bank will be evaluated on all three categories. And as we see um, in this brief excerpt I asked you to look at, and it's on page 900, um, this is really something that is watched by community advocates. And so anytime I will tell you a bank applies for really anything, and it's all public, um, community activists will look at their record, at their CRA record, and just at their record in general. And here we see they try to challenge an approval. Um, but I think we also see how the regulators really know how to protect themselves. So this Association of Low and Moderate Income Citizens, I mean, they seek to overturn this approval. They say that they have not really met their legal obligations. And of course, there is a kind of a procedural issue. One, they're really not allowed to do this. <laughs> There's no private right of action under the CRA. Um, but the court does go on to look at it anyway, because they say, you know, even if there were a private right of action, which there's not, this um, approval had 45 pages that looked at their CRA performance. I mean, I think it was probably just their CRA report, um, but I think it does illustrate how the regulators, they're gonna look at this, they're gonna include it in any kind of order that approves an acquisition, a merger, any, any type of activity that requires approval. And it also illustrates what we know to be true, which is that if a bank is going to be seeking approval, they will make big investments. They will make sure they're doing a lot of lending. They will really kind of fortify their position. And so there is research that very much establishes that the CRA does result in banks engaging in activities that they may not otherwise engage in. Now, depending on how you feel about the CRA, that may be good or bad news, um, but it definitely does have an impact on banks, which can be documented by their big CRA activities prior to seeking any kind of bank regulator approval. Um, so there are some that do feel that the CRA is sort of a, a, a law that that results in the misappropriation of bank resources and bank decision-making. Um, and there are those who would like to see it abolished, but I I don't see that happening probably anytime soon. It's, it's been around for a while and um, the banks are, are very used to it. Um, and so it is something though that they definitely monitor on their own because they know they will be examined and there will be a public report on their activities. So I think that, you know, this fair lending and um, anti-discrimination laws and oversight by the regulators is really an, you know, an interesting issue and it's getting a lot of regulatory attention these days. And so I welcome any questions um, that you may have or any uh, thoughts you might wanna add to the chat or the discussion board. Thank you.